Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Hello, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. It's Tuesday, May 9th, and I'm Patty Schlonsky, member of the City Club Board of Directors. As Cynthia said, today we are officially launching the City Club Book Club with Patterson Joseph's novel. The City Club Book Club was put on hiatus due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the actual date will be sometime in July. The book club began out of a com community interest to discuss noteworthy titles covering democracy, equity, free speech, and of course, history. We have hosted, hosted authors like Anand Jirdaras, author of Winners Take All, and Matthew Desmond, author of Evicted, and convened the book club around their books. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Patterson Joseph, award-winning actor and author of The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho, which will be our next book club book. In Patterson's debut novel, the story of Charles Ignatius Sancho is one that begins on a slave ship in the Atlantic and ends at the epicenter of London life. Sancho would become the first black man to vote in Britain, and he would lead the fight to end slavery in the country. The book received glowing reviews from the New York Times Book Review, The Guardian, and Kirkus Reviews, which called it an entertaining portrait that also illuminates the opportunities for black people in 18th century London. Combining history with compelling storytelling, The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho reignites the conversation around black excellence and identity and the challenges that remain today. Patterson Joseph is an award-winning actor he wrote and starred in the play Sancho, An Act of Remembrance in 2018, which was staged in the UK as well as the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. He's a veteran of television, film, and theater. Patterson has appeared in the Mosquito Coast, an Apple TV Plus original series, Doctor Who, Knots and Crosses, and other BBC programs. For our live stream audience, if you have a question for our speaker, you can text it to 330 541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet your question at the City Club, and City Club staff will try to work it into the second half of the program. Members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Patterson Joseph. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the wonderful welcome. Um, I am stunned, I think, by uh, how well-received the novel has been. I was going to write it anyway. <laughs> People now are asking me, when are you writing your second book? And I'm like, nobody wanted the first one. So. <laughs> But the fact that it's been well received has allowed me to, I suppose, think while I'm speaking about why I wrote it. Often as a creative, you make something just because you feel like, I've got to make this, whether that's a piece of music or uh, a work of art. And then afterwards, when people ask you questions about it, you then begin to think, yeah, why did I want to paint that, draw that, sculpt that? Let me really think about that piece of music or that poem, or that bit of writing. And it's helped me, it's almost been therapeutic, in fact. So let me start from the beginning. Why Charles Ignatius Sancho, and why a novel, The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho. I was born in 1964, full disclosure, and my parents are part of the Windrush generation. There's a few people nodding in this room, some who aren't quite sure what that is. Well, the Windrush was a ship. It was the HMT Empire Windrush, and it sailed from Montego Bay in Jamaica to Tilbury Docks in London, landed 
in June 1948, on the 21st of that month. The next day, the passengers disembarked. There were about 1,200 passengers, 805 or so of which, and two stowaways, were Caribbean. The two stowaways, actually, fascinating stories, but that's another tale. This was a generation of African-Caribbean people who had been part of the British Empire and who were at that time. Some had fought in the Second World War and some had helped with the war effort in the Caribbean. They came because the call came out to them to help post-war Britain rebuild its structures and rebuild its uh, national uh, railways, uh, bus systems, roads, uh, buildings, all of that. And they came. They came in their hundreds. From 1948 until the immigration laws changed in 1962 when they began to close the border because of racial tension and the usual complaints that all of these people, these strange people, were coming into our white country. The Britons, Britain didn't know who these people were. They'd had an empire for hundreds of years, but they didn't know who these people were. The Caribbeans absolutely knew who, where they were coming to. They were coming to the mother country. But here's what they found. Hostility, ignorance, violence, and aggression. My generation of, of, of pupils, we were called subnormal, educationally subnormal. We knew this was happening. I knew this was happening from the day I went to school at four and a half. And the teacher literally rejected me. I could see her rejecting me instantly. I didn't know what this was about until about, I suppose, 35 years later, when one of my teachers, a Goan teacher called Miss Bird, Mrs. Bird, the late, great Mrs. Bird, she said to me, when I talked to the nuns who were running the convent that you were going to about educating the black pupils, they said, there's no point. They'd never learn. And so this generation is called subnormal, and there's a BBC documentary that you can find that will show you how we were treated. Any inkling of any disruption in the class, you were sent out, you were excluded, you were suspended, you were expelled, you were sent to the lowest group for learning. I rejected school and ran off to the library most of the time. The world I'm living in now, in Wilsdon Green, northwest London, is a world where on every brick wall, every other brick wall, certainly on every street you'd see it, painted in white, trigger warning to anybody who doesn't like to hear this, but this is the truth, nigger, go home. Wogs, out. Blacks, go home. Britain is a white country. And you're seeing it not only officially, you're seeing it on the streets, you're seeing it everywhere. And as always, what do we do? We get on with it. We just get on with it. We go round it. We go through it, under it if we can. And you just get on with your life and you just do your stuff. Now I'm at this point, when I think about writing this story, about 35. And I'm playing cards. Uh, I'm in Thailand. I'm doing a movie called The Beach. And I'm working with Tilda Swinton. And uh, as always, Tilda's asking esoteric questions, so I'm about to play the Ace of Clubs, and she says, what would you like to be remembered for before you die? <laughs> I've just, I've just got to play this card, but here. That's a good question, Tilda. Um, do you know what? I would like to write a play, a book, film, a novel about black British life before the Windrush. Because I've heard rumours that there were black people here, and I want kids to know who they are. My generation of kids didn't really know who they were, and so I want the next generation to know. Okay, she says, and off, on we go. Carry on playing cards. I think I lost that turn. Because I was distracted by that, and I started to research instantly. Because here's the question I would get all the way through my life. See, say I'm about six and a half, and I'd get somebody saying to me, so uh, where are you from? Uh, Park Royal, I would say. It sounds posh but it's basically where the biscuit factory is in, in northwest London. And then they'd go, no, where, where are you from originally? And you can tell they're getting annoyed, but you carry on anyway. You say, Wilsdon Green, which is where we lived. And then they're almost in a rage. You can see it, sort of silent rage. No, where are your parents from? St. Lucia. Oh, they'd say, going off. 
satisfied. So I was like, wow, I want to tell a story that means that my son, who wasn't born yet, would know how to answer that question instantly and be able to say, I'm English. Right, that's a big deal. I was in Oxford not too long ago and I said this, I'm English. And it's a good crowd of liberal white people, mostly. And I, I say, I, I feel it too. And they laugh in relief. I said, I know. But when I go to France, I can't go like I used to. Je suis Britannique. Vous viens d'où? Uh, je suis Britannique. Je suis Londonien. They go, well, you can't say I'm a Londoner or I'm British. I'm British sounds like I'm the crown jewels. <laughs> I am the king. You can't say that. You have to say what everybody says. Vous viens d'où? Where are you from? Je suis anglais. Ah, they say. You can't say that in England. And even younger generation of people, you say, where are you from? Are you English? They go, no, I'm not English. Well, what are you then? Um, because their parents came from Jamaica or their grandparents came from Jamaica. I'm, 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 I'm half Jamaican, half British. That, that, that's not a place. And in, by the way, if I go to St. Lucia, where my parents are from, you hear what they call me? Englishman. I walk too fast, I talk too fast, my eyes are too big, I'm too curious. I'm not from there. They know I'm not from there, so where do I belong? So Sancho became a sort of catalyst for this idea of belonging. So how did I go about it? First thing I did was dig up some research. There's very little in 1999 online. There's a guy called Brick and Carey who'd been writing a little bit about black history. But before I found him, I got to, uh, I sort of, got a hint that there was a book out there called Black England, which was written by a lady called Gretchen Gertziner, who is uh, an African-American scholar, uh, writer, and historian, and that was the book to get. I opened this book, and I was stunned to find that there was a man who was emperor of the Roman Empire who came to Britain in about 192 AD, and he came with his wife and his two sons, and his name was Septimius Severus, and he was from Libya. What? I mean, I'm 36 now. I've never heard this. He came from Libya with his wife, Julia Domna, who was Syrian, and his two sons, Gaeta and Caracalla, and they ran Britain. They rebuilt Hadrian's Wall. And I'm already stunned. They brought 50,000 troops, possibly from Eastern Europe, certainly North African and Sub-Saharan African which is why my blonde-haired, blue-eyed friends are finding African DNA when they do their DNA studies and Eastern European DNA, and they thought they were Irish or they thought they were Scottish. And I'm stunned by this. I, mean, I, I come across John Blank with an E on the end. He was the trumpeter for Henry VIII. There's a tapestry called the Cloth of Gold Tapestry to celebrate King Arthur, uh, Prince Arthur, uh, King Henry VIII's son. And there he is, John Blank. He's in the record books and many other black musicians which came from the court of Catherine of Aragon, because the European courts had black musicians. There's Queen Elizabeth's decree. Queen Elizabeth I, this is Shakespeare's queen. Her Majesty, seeing that there are of late so many black amours in the realm, decrees that there are too many of those kinds of people in the land. They must be sent forth of the land and transported out of the realm. And so apparently there was a scheme to hire a boat to take them all to Spain to re-enslave them and no one turned up, which I always say in my one-person show, that is African time turned weapon of self-defense. <laughs> no one turned up. She didn't sign that decree, but the fact that they had created this decree meant that there were enough black people to use the usual excuse. The reason our economy is tanking, because it was at that point, is because of these people. An old, old playbook. So here I am now, finding out about these people. And then I open this book, and I see it's a black and white print of a man, a black man. And he's looking off to our left as we see the, the picture. And he's got a, a sort of smile on his face, a knowing smile. He's got a bright red waistcoat, so bright. It's extraordinarily bright. It's Disney bright, pinging out. And it's gold braiding and gold buttons and a dark blue frock coat. And his hair is beautifully coiffured. And it's a Gainsborough. And he looks like, I'm amazing, aren't I? I know you think I'm pretty special. 
and you may well be right. But I'm thinking, who is this guy? And I notice his hand is in his waistcoat, which is a sign, a symbol of a man of leisure. I find out that it was painted by Thomas Gainsborough, one of the, the best, I would say, portrait painter of the 18th century. Painted in 100 minutes in a place called Bath in the west of England in 1768. And he is the valet to the Duke of Montague at this point. And I think, I've got to find out about this man. And I do. I find out that he was born on a slave ship in 1729. He was orphaned by the time he was three. He was baptised in Columbia. And then at three years old, taken to England to live in Greenwich with three spinster sisters. We don't know who they are. He never mentions who they are. He only says that they stopped me from learning to read. He ran away from home at seven years old, was found by John, Duke of Montague, who believed in the extraordinary idea of black intelligence. Not subnormal, black intelligence. There's intelligence there. If they were only allowed to be educated. He saved and rescued a number of black people too from slavery, John, Duke of Montague. He finds this kid in this, uh, in this huge park and he says, I want to educate you. And the sisters say, no, no education. Like young black boys sometimes I grew up with, if I got a book out, oh, you're trying to be white. That story of you cannot read. What are you trying to be? Who do you think you are? We don't want you having information and facts in your head and thinking. We want you to be what we need you to be, which is docile and malleable. Content, because you have no ideas floating about in your head. So he does what no one else would allow him to do, which is sneak off, get books in the library. He becomes this erudite, articulate man. So much so that his books are published now, still being reprinted now. His books of letters, letters he wrote to the newspapers, to friends, to influential people, like Lawrence Stern, the playwright, the preacher and the, 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 the author of the first properly comic novel in the modern English language, Tristram Shandy. They became friends. Lawrence Stern wrote against slavery. And Sancho was influential in that. He became part of the royal family. Extraordinary life. He was a musician. Published his own work in his own lifetime. And he was also a shop owner. There were no racist laws about voting, there were only gender laws. Women couldn't own property. And if you voted, you had to own property. Isn't that funny? The idea of making obstacles for people to vote. And there he is, 1774, a year before you guys signed your Declaration of Independence, voting for the first time because he had a grocery store. Last time he voted, six years later, 1780, the year he died, at 51, he voted for the first proto-abolitionist candidate, Charles James Fox. And I always thought when I got to that bit, if he could do that then, my God, I've got to do something now. First place I performed properly, did a bit at the Oxford Playhouse. Nobody in England wanted the play. It was a post-racist world, I was told. Uh, this would have been 2010 through to about 2016. Couldn't find a venue. And so I fortuitously opened at the Kennedy Center in Washington. It was quite moving for me because Sancho had written one of his letters, you know, if this war with America passes and God spares me till then, I thought that we may travel there. But I stay in old England and talk about it, he says. And I cried a little bit, like the soppy actor I am. I cried a bit when we got there and there was a big poster and Sancho's face was up there. And I performed this play and it's 75 minutes and it's in 18th century language. And, you know, Sancho was meant to have had a speech impediment. So, you know, I'm slightly lisping and I'm thinking these kids and mostly kids are going to bury me. I'm not going to be able to get a word in edgeways. <laughs> And I had told my producer, please, it's got to be 13 and up. And I heard the human zoo on my tannoy in the dressing room. I said, how old are those children, Tim? And he went, oh, um, um, about eight years old, some of them. Eight, I said, get out. <laughs> so I was in a huff and I got on stage and it was just, was just and I went, I usually start the play like, hello, my name's Patterson, the author and actor. And, uh, you know, so everything you hear and see tonight is my fault. But in my brain, in a sort of Tourette's moment, I thought, why don't I just ask them their names? And I did. I went, my name's Patterson. 
what's your name? And I got this wave of Kwame and, and Miguel and Clarissa and just like a wall of it. If I had hair, it would have blown it all off. And then my producer was up there going, what do we do? How can we help him? The lighting guy said, he got himself into this trouble, he can get himself out. And they calmed down. And for 75 minutes, they were silent. And here's the powerful thing. When I'd finished the play, and he votes at the end, after having struggled to find his papers, these four African-American ladies, they would have been, I would say, in their late 70s, early 80s, they said this, son, this idea that you need to find your papers to prove that you can vote, it's not an old idea, son. That's happening to us today. And I was arrested. I was completely and utterly surprised that I had written a play that was so pertinent because I thought, we're living in a post-racist world. This is an old story. No, it's not. It's happening to us today, son. And I, and I became a sort of advocate for linking, if you like, what's happening in the African diaspora globally with what's happening with the African diaspora in America. You're not an exception, by the way. Slavery was global. Most of the captive Africans went to the Caribbean and to Brazil. Now, don't feel bad that you don't know this. I've only found this out recently. Brazil? And the Caribbean? More than North America? These are stories that are so global that you can find them in Russia. You can find them in Norway, in Scandinavian countries, Spain. You can find them in, uh, obviously, in South America. You can find them in North America. You can find them in uh, Nova Scotia. You can find them every, everywhere Europeans ever went and everywhere they used captive Africans. You will find our stories. And this is a British story. And I'd like to read a bit of the beginning of it, if I may. And I will begin uh, with the opening. Why a novel? It's the most intimate form of storytelling. Squiggles on a page, hieroglyphs, if you like, as Sancho calls them. They become, if you can decipher them, images in your head and memories, indelible memories. And no one's between you and the word. No one. That's why it's so precious. That's why people burnt books when they wanted to silence thought. And the next best thing is, I suppose, the spoken word. But I think that the best way to deliver a, a novel is for you to read it privately. So forgive me getting in the way. Um, but here's my interpretation of this novel. Uh, it starts with an epigraph. If you adopt the rule of writing every evening your remarks on the past day, it will be a kind of friendly tete-a-tete -tete between you and yourself, wherein you may sometimes happily become your own monitor. And hereafter, those little notes will provide you a rich fund whenever you shall be inclined to retrace past times and places. Charles Ignatius Sancho, 1729 to 1780. Prologue, 1775, 46 years old. Time away from one's diary is as valuable as a little time away from one's lover. Absence not only softens the tender feelings toward the beloved other, it also provides the benefit of perspective that renders the object of affection so much more precious and beautified. So too, with quill, ink, and leaf, I reunite my body with my mind, and the pleasure this act gives me has grown rather than diminished. For I speak and write to purpose now. I seek to lay forth a history that speaks of all the truths of my life up to this present day. To survey, like the architect of my own life, the line I have followed that brought me here. My history. Not chaotically rendered as in my earliest diary entries. No. As I see them now, put together to make sense of the whole. This, 
For you, my son, William Leach Osborne Sancho. Born last Friday, the 20th day of October, at exactly half past one in the afternoon. My second son, my only living son. I will speak to you as you will be, as I see you in my mind's eye, when you will find these pages carefully concealed in my old room at Windsor Castle. I speak to Billy, the gentleman. The instructions for finding these will be given to you before I pass, I know, with a certain knowledge that I will not live to see you at man's estate. So here am I, addressing the man, Billy Sancho. Know thy father and forgive him. I will not stint on necessary detail, but have no time for flights of fantasy, nor anecdote not pertinent to my aim, neither, which is no less than to render the truth of a complex web of a life, a life lived in many kingdoms, or so it seems to me presently. I'm now a shop owner, but old enough. I must uh, grasp the reins of my memory more firmly. I gallop ahead. Much of the following comes from my diary entries over the years. I will record my retrospective interjections. These may be useful in aiding my Billy to navigate the story of your father's life thus far. Uh, this rendering may benefit older Sancho too. When time has eroded precision <laughs> of even the most momentous twists and turns of a long life. Now, I began writing a diary in earnest at the age of 17. Those entries will appear in these pages as I see fit. And for the present, I will begin at the beginning. Book 1, 1729 to 1749, Chapter 1, in which Charles Ignatius Sancho relates his early life. 1729, Origin. I had, on reflection, little right to survive. Born on a slave ship, crossing the Atlantic Ocean on what is quaintly described as the Middle Passage. I now say a slave ship is neither in a passage, nor does it navigate the middle of anywhere. It sails straight to the heart of hell. My future articulacy would have astounded my master, standing a safe distance from the helpless African girl of unknown origin, a daughter of Eve from somewhere along the Guinea coast. Neither would it have occurred as a possibility to my terrified boy father, traumatised by the last day's events, emasculated by fear of the unknown. In contrast, his wife, my mother, is simply, luckily, lost in the bewildered agony of a painful breach birth. Lucky to be together at all, these child parents, captured and sold as slaves, I would guess, by a rival tribe's chief, the human spoils of war. Lucky. A charnel house of black flesh, this cramped and rank with rat droppings and the spillage of a thousand filthy slop buckets. Filth amassed over the 15 years of this ship's barbaric life, a life spent plying its brutal, unfeeling trade between the pestilential slaughterhouses of the Guinea or slave coast and the slow death of plantation life in the Americas, which awaited the cursed souls who were doomed to never return home. Neither they nor their offspring permanently lost tribe. Let us roam. Leaving the child parents to their agonies for a moment, let us venture to the next deck down. No, not that lower mezzanine deck, that one's with the picking in it. Oh, they're going to really pack them in there. Conveniently small, these little ones, they hardly complain at all, but simply lie in stupefied terror. All the better, much less trouble that way, quieter, no. We need to look at the lowest deck. We find the men's quarters. Quite the largest space in the ship. Roomy. Or at least it would be. 
if 300 men were not crammed head to toe so tightly that no room can be afforded for the slightest movement without feeling the calloused skin of a stranger's feet or the tangled woolly roughness of the hair of one's neighbour, pungently ripe with sweat and the acrid smell of fear and death, the rhythmic rolling of the ship accompanied by the groans of hundreds of men who cannot speak or understand each other's languages. Divide and rule starts early in the seasoning process. Yes, that shameless word. For the conditioning for a life of slavery that the white and black traders along this treacherous coast give to the slave apprenticeship. An apprenticeship that starts in earnest once the enslaved soul has reached their destination, usually a plantation of one kind or another, cotton, sugarcane, tobacco, crops that bring ready money. Commerce. Where will your cruelty end? Let us hurry back up to the birth cabin. Our young mother-to-be is about to bring our main subject forth, past the mid-deck with the young girls' and women's deck, half the area of that of the men, and made more uncomfortable for them by the fact that some are in stages of pregnancy akin to our lady above, who now we see has expired. There is the dumbstruck master. The surgeon charged with midwifery duties, guiltily sullen. The near catatonic gaze of the frightened boy father, now without a soul who knew him free. He has the fleeting notion to bolt from the room, broken, perhaps to fling himself overboard, broken by the loss of his wife, his life's companion. Futile. He will be shackled below with the rest. And what are the debris left in the wake of this storm of grief, the, the mewling, puking infant boy, soon baptised Charles Ignatius, after the founder of the Jesuits, and growing strong and round, always round, in New Granada. On arrival, Billy, when first my father, your grandfather, saw that the colour of the majority of labourers on that benighted dock matched his own. He set his eye on a dozing overseer's unguarded scabbard, seized the man's sword, then swiftly slipped the blade from his own guts to his heart before any had time to register the act. He died in merciful seconds, and my world contracted yet again. This the story I have pieced together from the fragments I harvested from servants' gossip, the indiscretions of my guardians, my own meditations, my nightmares. My story is just that, a story, neither better nor worse than any enslaved orphan of Afrique's. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're about to begin the audience q and I'm Patty Shlonsky, a member of the City Club Board of Directors. We are joined today by award-winning actor and author Patterson Joseph. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those joining via our live stream at cityclub.org. For our live stream audience, if you'd like to tweet a question for our speaker, please tweet it at the City Club. You can also text it to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794, and City Club staff will try to work it into the program. May we have the first question, please? I really liked uh, what sh how you described um, the audience reaction at the Kennedy Center. Oh, um, were there other uh, personal testimonies uh, given to you besides the one um, where the women said, well, no, we have to show ID in order to vote here? Yeah, I mean, I suppose um, everywhere I went, I received a, a sort of bit of uh, the jigsaw, if you like, um, that made a bit more of a connection with me uh, as a black British person. 
uh, one of the funniest things that happened was I was at the National Black Theatre in Harlem. And it is a space that's been there since 1968. Um, uh, very few people in the neighbourhood knew about it back then. This is 2018. I think it's been redone now and uh, a bit more of a showy place. But anyway, I performed the show and I did the Q&A. And an African-American man uh, in his middle age uh, very much looked like a, a, a teacher, perhaps a lecturer. He got up and he went, after I told them a little bit about um, the Windrush generation in particular. Uh, son, we African-Americans, we don't know a lot about the African diaspora outside of our own country. What are you doing to bring together the British uh, diaspora and the uh, American diaspora? And I went, nothing, I'm just an actor. I'm just doing this play. And I think that resonated with me though afterwards, like a seed. Like there is a reach, there is something to be done with that. There is a bridge that needs to be built because we both think of ourselves as being exceptional in some ways, we're exceptions. The Caribbean story and the African-American story are different. They are subtly different. The story of Africans on European soil is also subtly different. It has its own psychological um, damage and violence. It's not altogether the same, but there are connections that we can make, certainly to do with being um, cut out of the, the story of your nation. Walter Mosley, your wonderful uh, writer, say, says that a people that don't exist in its country's literature can be said to not exist at all. If I've read, and I did, I mean, I, I played truant at school for many years because it was such a hateful system, as I explained to you. I would just hide out in the library, in the local library, and I read, you know, David Copperfield, and I read um, Jane Eyre, and Pride and Prejudice, and uh, Oliver Twist, and I engaged with these stories, 100%. And it's only later when I think, but all of those heroes were white. I did not play a part in any of those stories in any way. And even Dickens, with his wonderful eye view, didn't take in the black communities that would have been around in that time. I mean, there were at least 20,000 black people in London in the middle of the 18th century, and it's a city of only 600,000 people, and they're very visible, not to say you're talking about even the mixed heritage people who would have been part of that group. That's a big demographic. Some enslaved came with their masters, some free, some sailors, but they were there, and to be, to be ignored is a very similar thing to what's happening with the African American. So that is, along the way, the thing that has caused me to feel that there is a, a definite bridge and a connection. Hello. Hi, hi, Mr. Joseph. I have enjoyed um, you immensely. I did my graduate work on Ignatius Sancho. Um, I also included uh, Adaba Cuguano and Equiano, and I'm wondering if you use their stories as well to immerse with uh, Sancho's voice, and, and I'd like to say that uh, I'm enamored at how much you captured his voice in your writing. It feels like him uh, from the work that I did. Thank you. Thank you, lovely question. Um, so, a younger man uh, who had been captured when he was about nine years old and taken to America and got himself basically uh, freed himself through his own self-education and earning money himself, it was called uh, Alauda Equiano. His, if you like, slave name, his captive name was Gustavus Vassa, but he decided to, if you like, find a new name for himself. And Alauda Equiano is the name. And he uh, came to London, he's younger than Sancho, uh, by, by a few decades, came to London in the 1770s, I would imagine, late 1760s perhaps, and he formed a group called the Sons of Africa. Uh, two famous men who were part of that, a guy called James Groniasaw and Otaba Caguano, who you mentioned. And one of the reasons why I focused on Sancho was there's so little written about him, and he himself didn't write a biography, an autobiography, whereas Equiano did, and if you want to find out about uh, the 18th century and the details of what it is to be enslaved in the British um, colonies, that's a great, that's a great um, narrative to read, um, uh, Alada Equiano's. 
But how do we find out about a man who we don't know much about? Wonderful um, a writer, uh, historian, and, and, uh, and uh, teacher, Sadia Hartman, um, African-American lady, talks about a thing that she describes as critical fabulation. He's not the first to come up with this notion, and I've been doing it for 20 years, but now I have a nice, fancy American phrase for it, critical fabulation. And it's not just making up stuff. What you do is you look and you say, hey, say it's your grandmother, and you go, what do we know about her? She was born in Alabama, she uh, worked in Kentucky, and she died in New York. She possibly was a seamstress. That's all we know about her. Well, that's not a person, that's just a bunch of facts. How do you find out about the person? Well, what you do is you look at other women of her generation in Alabama at that time. What were they doing? What were they up against? What was that migration to Kentucky about? What would they have found in Kentucky? And why did she then move to New York? What were other women doing? So you build a story around other people's stories who are similar, who share a similar demographic. And eventually you'll build a picture and with research and things are coming out all the time, you'll build a more and more coherent, specific picture. picture. The voice side of it, that's my job. I'm an actor. I'm an actor. I, I immerse myself in whatever character I'm playing, however strange that person might be. I, I did a show here called The Leftovers. Such a strange show. Even I didn't know what was going on. And I'm playing a character who hugs, who hugs the pain out of people. And yet, I have to delve into that character as if I know them and I somehow like them. You have to, even if they're strange characters. And he wasn't a hero by any means. So we hot seat, was what actors do. What's your problem? Oh, my problem is my mother uh, just married my uncle. It's disgusting. Oh, God, yeah, my, my dad's just died about two weeks ago. I don't know why she's doing it. And then you go, oh, okay, that's Hamlet's under... That's his, that's his backstory, if you like. That's the subtext. So he might come on and go, oh, that this too, too sullied flesh might melt Thor and resolve itself into a dew. This is not just poetry. It's him trying to express what I've just said in the background, which is my mum has married this man and she shouldn't have done. And, and this is what I was doing with Sancho. Like I had the one man show public because I pretend that you're coming in to see him having his portrait painted. Oh, you see who I am. Well, let me talk to you about who I really am. And I tell a story that way. And then you see him in his shop, his grocery store, and you're coming to visit him and he's old and he's looking for his papers everywhere in this chaotic store. And then you see him on the hustings, which was a public show of hands. Public, everything public, portrait, public, a performance, letters, public, a performance. Hardly anybody could read or write. So the man or the woman of the house would read the letters. So they had to be censored. And so how do you get to the private? You do hot seating. What did I really think? What did I really think about living with three women who I had to sort of be a comfort to? and not be rude to, and always keep myself silent around. What did I see? What did I smell? What did it feel like to be touched by these women, to have to go to bed to keep them warm? What did it feel like to be fed very well, but know that there are black people around me who were starving? What did it feel like to walk the streets of Greenwich like a pet, dressed up, not allowed to speak? What did it feel like to have all this intelligence bubbling around and no way to articulate it? What did it feel to finally get a hold of an harpsichord and be able to play music? What did it feel like to be in the Duke of Montague's library and see all those books coming alive and all that information and all those places I could travel to? What was it like unlocking that? And that's really, I suppose, why his voice is authentic, as authentic as I could get it, because I immerse myself in his world and the world around him and in his writing, more specifically. I finished reading your brilliant story just last night, and I find myself wondering, what wonderful story are you going to share with us next? Do you have any ideas that are percolating? Right, this is over. Let's go, everybody. <laughs> have a nice time. What? I mean, this is, again, I said, this is the question I get. Nobody's ever wanted anything I've ever written. Um, I tell you what I want to do. This is what I want to do next, and I don't know if I'll get... I'll, I'll do it, whether anybody buys it or not, I don't know. So if you Googled black people in portraiture, Google image, you'll see hundreds of portraits of the great and the good in European history. Hundreds, since, I suppose, the 1500s. And you'll see the Duke of Brandenburg, or Charlotte, who is the Princess Royal, or you'll see 
Christina, who is part of the Russian royal family, and you'll see that they'll talk about who that person is, they'll talk about the horse, let's maybe even name the horse, or the dog, or whatever, and Negro child. And Negro child. And it's a girl, and it's a boy, and you can see their faces are beautifully painted, because in those days, they really wanted to get as close to the subject as possible and paint them for real. And then you cry out, hey, what, who are these people? They're, oh, well, they weren't really people. They were just, you know, they might have just been models that they used again and again. It's like, yes, but what is the name of the model? And what happened to them when they got, oh, no, no, we don't know. And so, and Negro child in all these museums. And servant. And their black servant. And so my task, and it's happening, it's happening slowly, but it's happening, is to delve into these archives to find out the stories of these children. So that like Sancho's portrait, when you look at it, you go, ah, that's Ignatius Sancho. He's the first black man to vote. You might not know anything more. You may hopefully have read my novel and go, he did this and that and the other, but you'll know who he is. And I want that for all of these kids. And if you can't figure out who the kid is, at least tell me that you see the kid and you don't say a Negro child. So that's my sort of campaign, really. That's the next thing I want to do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm just halfway through your novel. Oh. <laughs> but I love that I'm going to be able to hear your voice now when I read it. Um, when I first started reading it, though, I could tell right away it was written by an actor. Huh. And I'm wondering how much of the actor was shadowing the author as hmm. you were writing. That's a great question. Uh, and you've caught me out, yes. Um, OK, there's a... There's a, there's a there's, an, there's a sort of compulsion when you're a storyteller of any kind to tell your story in the way that reflects the way you'd like to hear it told. So I think every piece of creation, no matter what it is, has the author in it, whether it's a sculptor or whether it's a painter uh, or uh, someone who makes installations whether it's a writer, a rapper, whether it's a, a singer, a ballad writer, you are in that piece of work. And the more you embrace yourself within that, the better. When I first performed the play, we were just sitting around a table at the National Theatre um, Studio in London, this would have been 2010. And I remember reading it, uh, the first big version of it, and a, a colleague of mine said, oh gosh, that's very autobiographical. And I was enraged. I was enraged by this comment. What do you mean it's autobiographical? I didn't say it to his face, but I was so mad. This is an 18th century man, I'm not an 18th century man. He's a musician, I'm not a musician. What are you talking about? He, he's nothing like me. And then over the years I, I went, well, of course he is. He, he's a man who was not allowed to learn to read. He was educationally subnormal, just as I was. He snuck away and read whatever he could read, like I did in Wilson Green Library. He was not meant to achieve what he, was, what he achieved, which is very similar to my story. He worried about the next generation, that all these things that I've tried to make space for, the Royal Shakespeare Company at the Royal National Theatre, all these things that my generation has sort of opened up since 1988 when I left, is it now going to close back in as we drift off into doing movies and people want to do television? Are the next generation going to have to start from the beginning? That Sancho's worried. Is slavery going to come back? It's, it, no institute, nothing that we've ever done has ever been so solid that it can't be rolled back. We've seen what happened with Roe v. Wade. Nothing is permanent. W things need to keep being reiterated. The Holocaust is being forgotten, rewritten. I'm sure slavery, I mean, I know slavery is trying to be, people are trying to rewrite that too. Britain does not want any more than right-wing America does not want to understand colonialism and understand slavery and understand how important this is for us to talk about as a nation. Nations are families. You're randomly born in a nation and now you're part of it. It might reject you, your family, but you're still part of that family, like it or not. And so what family therapist, I will say this, I've said this a few times, what family therapist is going to sit down with the family and go, look, you guys are dysfunctioning, things aren't going really going well, you're not understanding them, they're not understanding you, this is terrible, let's do something about it, let's all sit down. And the therapist's conclusion is, no, no, wait, don't tell your stories, let's just forget about everything in the past, 
and carry on to the future. And off they go, expecting to get paid. You wouldn't pay them a penny. This is nonsense. And so with a nation, it's the same. You can bury everything you want, but the internet exists. And so it will be found out. And woe betide the generation that tries to stop the next generation from learning because you will be hated and vilified, quite rightly. This truth will out. Let's tell it. Let's lance this boil. Let's talk. Yes, sir. Wow. Uh, that was incredible. First of all. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm only going to ask two. Um, so the, the, the first question is about your experience at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Huh. So um, I'm about halfway through uh, this book, um, but I first encountered you in the, the production of Julius Caesar. And it actually it brought the story to life in a way that I hadn't ever experienced it before. In fact, I didn't know what it was about, and I had read it like two or three times in school. And so um, I think part of that had to do with just the context clues, the fact that a black person was embodying this script, mm. right? Mm. A black cast. And that felt very like um, eye-opening, and it blew my mind, and it made me appreciate that text more. But my question is two-part. The first part is, like, what is the significance of the Royal Shakespeare Company? And how is it that so many black British actors are, are coming through that, that space? So if you could explain that and explain your experience. Um, but the other question is, did you intentionally try to make that character um, black? Were you attempting to make that character read as black? OK, lovely. Thank you. OK, great questions. Um, so, Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, can we talk about Shakespeare first? Uh, very, oh gosh. You know, my New Year's resolution was to be pithy. And I can, I can feel my, my, my partner here just going, you haven't been pithy. Um, <laughs> so, I'll try and be brief. I'll try and be brief. Uh, so, I first came across Shakespeare when I was 14 years old. Uh, I accidentally... Uh, was going to audition for the National Youth Theatre. Accidentally, because my mate, Tony Leonce, who was just like extraordinary, he was doing it. I was like, yeah, I'll do that too. And then he pulled out, but I was left in to it. Oh, God. So the teacher who did history, I never did drama. Why would I do drama? What's the point of me doing drama? She threw me, and I do remember it as being throw me, The Merchant of Venice, right? A Shakespeare play, The Merchant of Venice. And she said, you know, just take a piece from that and you do your audition out of that. I was like, oh, I don't even know what I'll I don't even know what this is. So I take it home and I open it. And oh my God, I mean, this is amazing. Because I'm a mumbler, right? What's your name? Person. What's your name? Person. Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> so terribly shy. And so uh, I open this book and I think it's a play. It's a play. And what do people do with plays? I suppose they read them out and it's out loud thing. So I open this thing up and I go, in sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me, you say it wearies you, but how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff tis made of, whereof it is born, I am to learn. And such a want wit sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. I'm thinking, God, I understand that. This guy's depressed and he doesn't even know why. He's depressed and he doesn't know why. And I'm thinking, I get this and I can hear it even now and I can feel it on my skin it's like this is for you this is for you you can read this and I learned this Shylock speech and I did the speech I was too shy to get into this place I mean god the guy asked me <laughs> and we don't even look each other in the eye where I come from right a man looking another man in the eye is a provocation that guy's either gay and wants something or he's trying to beat me up or trying to get my money which is a terrible thing when you go for a an interview and you can't look someone in the eye it's a terrible thing but it's part of your culture, Dr. P. This guy was like, so, why do you want to join the National Youth Theatre? <laughs> my instant physical reaction was this. And I said, and I meant it, but I said, because I like meeting people. And of course the guy was going, you're going to be eaten alive. We can't bring you into this thing. So I didn't get in. But I remember that Shylock speech. I remember the sarcasm of the speech. I remember the power of being able to say, oh, Signor Antonio, many a time and often in the Rialto, you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. And I remember thinking, this is about a man who's been oppressed, 
but they want something from you. We don't respect you, but we need that thing that you can give us. And I, God, I understood that. So come to the Royal Shakespeare Company now, which is, of course, the biggest Shakespeare producer in the United Kingdom. Been going officially, really, since 1960. Very few lead black actors in that theatre, even over the years. My mate, Dr. Jamie Rogers, has written a book on black and Asian Shakespeareans, which I'm sure you know, and it details just how few they've been. I happened to have been one of them, playing Troilus in Troilus and Cressida. I was doing... Whew, I haven't been pivy at all. Let me just try and be quick now. I was doing... I was doing... Um, Love's Labour's Lost, and I was playing one of the lords who decide to, no more women, we're just going to study, no more women, and of course women arrive and they're like sneaking around each other writing plays and sonnets for, this, for these women. But I play Dumaine, and at some point I say, for my transformation, I would like to um, change from this European Edwardian England, so 1900s garb, to an African garb, robe, and can I do that? Yeah, 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 yeah fine. Oh, that would be yeah. very colourful. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah so. <laughs> so off I went, all the things. And one day I was like, let me do it in an East African accent. Because I've done that accent before and I knew it was crisp. And of course, this posho accent that I've got, this weird hybrid accent, was unknown to Shakespeare. Until the Hanoverian kings in the, 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 the 1700s, no one spoke like this. They couldn't go path, bath, grath, like the people who came from Cornwall, who came founding fathers. Path, bath, get, and hard R's. That's how they talk in Cornwall, like that. You go down the path, you go down the grass. And then, of course, that comes to America, and that's why you guys have got that accent. And then, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then you do Shakespeare, and you try and sound like us. No, we should be trying to sound like you, because that would have been more recognizable to Shakespeare. So I always knew that this accent was false. And so let me try and then you start to say, there's a bit of Hamlet. So you go, um, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them to die to sleep. This is, this is, this is lyrical in my mouth. And so I start doing this stuff. And the guy goes, this is wonderful. But of course, there were no black people in England before 1948. <laughs> and so you can't do the accent. So I'm, I, was, I, was, I was too young to go get the... Cause, and I didn't know enough. So, so for me, when we came to do Julius Caesar, and we all did it, you know, we did the read-through, and, you know, they, were, they did a symposium because they weren't sure if setting it in Africa was going to work. Ridiculous. But they, yeah. so we did that. And then, and then just before that, that first reading, I said to Greg Doran, uh, the outgoing artistic director, but he hadn't even been appointed at that point. But I said to him, this is in 2012, do you mind if I um, do an African accent for the reading to, to, to today in front of the board and all the people who are going to decide? And I could see his face. He was like, yeah, yes, yes. And then he sort of went off worried. I was like, it'd be fine, it'd be fine. So I started in. I started in with this accent. And all the other guys were like, Oh, are we doing that now? And they did. They gradually got into it. And you could tell it sort of elevated everything. And because John Carney, who used to run the market theatre, said that this is Shakespeare's African play, because it's about a country that has a hero as their leader who becomes sort of godlike and untouchable and a bit of a dictator. And then they get rid of him and then there's a vacuum and the coup happens and the vacuum which causes the worst person to rise that felt like such an African story. Not every nation, but a lot of them. And so it grew as a story. It grew as an idea, not just the accent. It was about what we were doing here. And it was, it was resonating with, with people in Africa, but also obviously people in America when we came to the Brooklyn Academy, in Moscow when we did the Moscow Art Theatre, and everywhere we went. And the best place, I'm not even saying it because I'm in Ohio, was Columbus, Ohio. Oh, the welcome we got in Columbus, Ohio. African dancers, a mayor who looked like Billy D. Williams. <laughs> Google it, kids. Google it. A beautiful man. Uh, and this was, this was the, the culmination of it. And so, yeah, partly to do with, with wanting it to have that flavour, but also because it fitted. It really fitted. Shakespeare in any other accent but this, to be honest with you, flies. Oh, can, uh, if, I, if I promise to be really brief, yeah, can I? Yeah. 
I promise I'll be brief. Okay, so my name is Kyle I'm from FC Square High School. I'm a ninth grade freshman, and I wanted to know, who, since we are currently learning about American history, and at one point we were learning about slavery and learning how much of an impact slavery was onto black African Americans, we and now coming here, seeing how it wasn't just America, and seeing that it was more just Britain around the world, hearing your stories, hearing. St I mean, hearing stories from other people that are not from America. And I wanted to know, what did you mainly think about um, how in America it's mainly just portrayed as, oh, only America and the Caribbean had people who, I mean, had mainly slavery, even though in Britain they had racism and slavery and in other countries around the world. Maybe in the Fiji Islands they were doing slavery there. And a lot of Pacific Islands also have slaves that were taken by European, I mean, that were put in by Europeans. So I wanted to know your opinion on that. Mate, you've just said everything. I don't even need to, you, your knowledge is so vast already. Please keep on with this. And the more of you young people who find this out, the more the next generation are gonna know so that we don't get the disappearance of history. So please keep on with what you're doing. And yes, of course, um, it is not exceptional. African-American history, and neither is African-British or African-Norwegian or Swedish history. It's all one story. It's an economic story, and it's also a story of racial hatred and division. And it needs to be told, and it's wonderful that you guys, young as you are, are delving into it. And there are many other stories, of course, we know that haven't been told, yes. because it, most of the stories have been told by white men and by middle-class people, of course, and upper-class people, because they're the people with the time and the power, <laughs> traditionally. So our stories from our perspective, if you're gay, if you're LB, LGBT, you know, QIA, plus these stories are not being told. Women's stories largely haven't been told. So there's a lot out there to be told. So keep digging and thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patterson Joseph, for joining us at the City Club, and thank you to Third Space Reading Room for providing on-site book sales this afternoon. Today's forum is part of the City Club's Authors in Conversation series in partnership with Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, the John P. Murphy Foundation, and the Cuyahoga County Public Library. The City Club is grateful for your continued support. We would like to welcome guests at the tables hosted by Cleveland Public Library, Caramu House, MC Squared STEM High School, and Third Space Action Lab. Thank you all for being here today. And just announced, the City Club is pleased to host Jason Buttigieg, teacher, writer, and husband of Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation. Jason will be here to discuss his new young adult ad adaptation of his book, I Have Something to Tell You. Also on Wednesday, May 24th, the City Club will highlight the evolution of women's basketball in Cleveland, featuring speakers from the NCAA, WNBA, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and Cleveland State University. For information on these forums and more, visit cityclub.org. That bring us, brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you once again to Patterson Joseph, and thank you members and friends of the City Club. I'm Patty Schlonsky, and this forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.